and sampling potato leaf hopper and alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And that led me um, into IPM, basically, it, because there was no, you know, IPM was supposed to have biocontrol in it, but nobody was doing biocontrol at that time. So every chance I got, I tried to learn more about biocontrol. Um, so as it turned out, um, this um, um, alfalfa, mm -hmm. besides training me in IPM, it brought me directly into contact with the very first work on IPM in the world. And that work was done by these fellows, uh, Vern Stern, Ray Smith, Sam and Bosch, Ken Hagen. These are like the most famous biocontrol guys from that era. And what they had discovered is that when alfalfa was sprayed for a moth, all of a sudden this alfalfa aphid would break out. Mm -hmm. And they realized that if people didn't start paying attention to natural enemies in the field, they were going to be killing them all and we, and um, incurring all these pest outbreaks. So they started something called um, uh, integration of chemical and biological control. Okay. And it was in alfalfa. So they got me started. Great, wonderful. That's really interesting background, probably for some of the younger people who are watching this, where it just seems so common now to realize that in the space of your career, you know, how much it's changed. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, um, could we talk about what to, a good definition of biocontrol? Well, everybody offers definitions, mm -hmm. and they're always changing them. Mm -hmm. um, but these guys actually offered a definition, and it's pretty good. Um, this is their definition. I know it's long and mm -hmm. complicated, but they uh, were really careful when they created these definitions. They I, they worked on them really hard, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so parasites, predators, pathogens mm -hmm. um, that act on a host of prey, and they lower the population level. Mm -hmm. So they were really careful to say, it might not necessarily be the population level that you want, mm -hmm. but in, in my day, of course, we're trying to use biocontrol to get the populations at the level that we want. And biocontrol also looks on our natural enemies. It kills our natural enemies, too. Mm -hmm. So I use natural enemies, biocontrol, uh, many beneficials all interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, so here me do this, I, I, I'm usually talking about the same thing. But it's, this is the definition that they put forward, and it's a good definition. I think it stands well. So here's um, microbials are pesticides that are created from these things, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and so on. Um, we are using all of these in a big way these days. Um, it's just it's just amazing, mm -hmm. totally amazing how far we've come. Mm -hmm. uh, we're selling nematodes uh, by the million, billions now, um, billions every week. We, my company doesn't sell uh, microbials, mm -hmm. um, but and we sell beneficial insects and mice, mm -hmm. probably by the millions. Um, not every week, but well, in some weeks. In, the, in, in season, we're selling beneficial insects by the millions. Oh. Okay. And is that based on, on demand? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the beneficial insects have seasons, mm -hmm. so it's it's a difficult it's a difficult business, just like scouting. You scouting, you only have work in summer, mm -hmm. um, and beneficial insects and mice, you only have work for that season, mm -hmm. and you have to be ready before the pest shows up, and sometimes the pest shows up earlier, sometimes it shows up later, so you have more natural enemies than you can sell, so you just have to put them in the freezer. <laughs> okay. And if you miss the season, mm -hmm. tough luck. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Um, so how does all of this um, relate to IPM? Well, um, 
see here. Let's see what I'm doing with next. Okay. Yeah. When they um, created that book, they actually mm -hmm. wrote a definition. It was an IPM at the time. It was integrated control. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was to integrate pesticides with natural enemies in a way that wasn't so disruptive. Um, and they actually took it to the level that we're still using today. This book was amazing. Mm -hmm. They defined economic control. They defined economic injury level. They defined economic threshold, ecosystem. And they have two pages of definitions. This is only part of it. So this is all due to these guys. Mm -hmm. They went on to do great things, these guys. Bandon Bosch wrote a lot of books on biocontrol. Hagen was the father of ladybugs. He wrote the economic review on ladybugs. Um, they, they were just totally amazing. So, so I was able to take that a little farther and um, create a business out of it. And the business is IPM Laboratories. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to do that, I had to do many, many, many different jobs. And that included um, working in vegetables, apples, alfalfa, did a lot of gypsy moth work, all working mostly scouting, some consulting, um, and whenever I could, fitting biocontrols in. But it wasn't very easy to fit the biocontrols in. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it looks like you uh, started producing DCAs in uh, 1985. 1985, yeah. So Van and Bosch and Stern and all those guys wrote that book in '59. Mm -hmm. So it was more than 55 years ago, mm -hmm. and we've been producing since for about 30, 31 years. Yeah, a good amount of experience. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, what is um, our ideal for a natural balance? Yeah, how how would it look mm -hmm. if um, things were divinely beautiful mm -hmm. in the in the crop world? We have it all the time, actually. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, when you look at a crop, it doesn't have any pests, mm -hmm. and that's because it's under natural control. Um, what we did one time, I, I was able to look at a, oh yeah, I was able to look at a garden and um, all the plants in that garden would normally be really heavily invested with thrips. Mm -hmm. And in that garden there were no thrips or there were very few. And the ideal is that there are very few pets, pets are rare. And that um, the uh, natural enemies are constantly keeping them down. Mm -hmm. So, because that is happening, you know that the environment is supporting the natural enemies. And this is what it looks like. Oh, in this case, I was looking at Aureus, mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bug mm -hmm. that goes after thrips. It's a really, really great predator. This is the nymph, and these are on marigold flowers. They love gluten plants. And they don't like some plants. So in this garden, um, it was a trial garden. There were all these different flowers being displayed for their what they look like um, in Canada for a seed producer. And um, the thrips were three per ten samples. The the worst was nine per ten flowers. Mm -hmm. In a greenhouse, when thrips are an outbreak, you're going to see four to 50 thrips in a flower. And in this situation, there was less than one in all cases, less than one thrips per flower. So that was this is a natural balance situation. Mm -hmm. What was very, very odd, you got Aureus and a lot of samples with no thrips at all. We've got no more 
thrips than aureus in any of the of the samples. And um, how can you do that? How can you have more predators than you have prey? How is that possible? It this this is an existence. It's really happening here, you know. And we don't expect this, but this is a natural balance situation. And this is what happened. It was in August. Mm-hmm. Or it's likely to be high in August, but still, there's somebody joining the meeting. <laughs> so in the end, this is what it looked like. There were almost twice as many aureus as there were thrips. Um, you aureus avoid each other because they are predations on each other. So you didn't see more than two at a time. And um, there were no thrips on many of the flowers. And aureus don't seem to like petunias. They were not there. So, and there were no thrips in any of the flowers that had an aureus. So that's an example in, of what natural control can look like. Beautiful. Thank you. And we aim for that in greenhouses. Right. And what I hear is it's possible. And it can be great. And it can be brought to its natural harmony. Yeah. Right. So um, what advice do you have for someone who's getting into um, the field? There's a, um, into the field of biological control? Yes. Well, you have to learn your crops, mm-hmm. learn your pests. Um, learn your natural enemies. And um, I actually got advice on this years ago from one of the people that worked with Van den Bosch as a technician. His name was Dick Dietrich. Mm-hmm. And he was the founder of Rincon by Tova, or he bought, he purchased Rincon by Tova, which is an insectary still today mm-hmm. in California. And he said, get out there and start scouting and consulting and learn where something is needed and and help the growers figure out how to use biocontrol. You can do that. It's easier today than ever before because possibly 50% of the greenhouses are now using biocontrols. Mm-hmm. Possibly. Um, they're using, if they're not using natural beneficial insects or mites, they're definitely they're using nematodes or they're using microbials. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very feasible. Okay. And what's your best advice for home gardeners? For home gardeners, I really don't think they need to purchase biological control. I think they need to uh, create a habitat that's good for the natural and mm-hmm. Um, all they need to do is create a lot of diversity, make sure that there's always flowers available for the natural enemies to feed on. They need pollen, they need nectar, and they need all the little prey that are going to be on these diverse plants. Um, if the natural enemies aren't already there, it's because there wasn't the habitat for them. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't need to be a specific type of habitat. It just needs to be a diverse habitat, and there always needs to be something in bloom. But it doesn't need to be. Um, does it need to be specific plants that need to be in bloom? Uh, well, for some, it, it it does. There are some specific plants. I have a slide here somewhere about um, tiffia. Mm-hmm. Yes, right there. Mm-hmm. Back. There you go. Yeah. Um, it's a little wasp that goes after Japanese beetles. Mm-hmm. And can we go to that website? Is it possible? I uh, bet you we might be able to. Uh, there it is. Mm-hmm. So if we can just scroll down there. Hold on one second. I think I have to. Um, I have to share my screen. Okay. So this little wasp loves peonies. Mm-hmm. And it. Um, Go that there's the grub with the wasp larva mm-hmm. uh, on it, and the the if you go down and scroll down the the little wasp looks like ants. 
on peonies. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people have seen ants on peonies, but maybe they were seeing tithia. Mm -hmm. So peonies at one time were really, really popular ornamental plants. Mm -hmm. They're coming back in popularity now, but you'll see them in the old gardens. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can get this, uh, if you can just support the tithia with these peonies. So that's another example. Sometimes the diversity has to be specific mm -hmm. diversity. Well, that makes me feel better. I have lots of peonies in my garden. So. And <laughs> Japanese beetles? Do you have any Japanese beetles on your roses? No. No, I don't. No. Yeah, I don't have many roses, so I have deer. <laughs> apple trees? Um, Japanese beetle loves any rosacea, apple trees, peonies, mm -hmm. or um, roses, mm -hmm. uh, all the raspberries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So yeah, diversity. But sometimes you can ha you can choose certain plants as insectary plants, and certainly peonies are one of them. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, work was done by Anna Legrand at University of Connecticut, and I think it was supported by Northeast IPM. Mm -hmm. I think it's at the bottom of that web page. Yes, I think so. Oh. There's mm -hmm. a little uh, yeah. That little wasp is naturally occurring throughout uh, the northeastern United States. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the rest of the country. Okay, great. So I'm just going to turn off this sharing of this so that we should be able to go back to um, the PowerPoint. Is it going back to does it share back to the PowerPoint? Okay. Excuse me one minute while we play with technology. So there we go, we should be back, there we go, so great. So um, what challenges do you see uh, with biocontrol to climate change and um, changing grower practices? Um, what do you, first of all, let's look at climate change. What challenges do you see? You know, we're moving back and forth with changing seasons so much. We're just always adjusting as we just, I don't really, um, it's possible that crops are going to be moving north and the pests with them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we'll see, um, who knows, <laughs> if it gets warm enough, we'll see fire ants up here. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're, my company works all over the, the, the country, so we're serving everybody. And we just roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you haven't seen anything so far? Um, no, I'm not, I can't really name an example at the moment. Right, that's fine. Yeah. You need to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. We do work in greenhouses an awful lot, and we're controlling mm -hmm. our environment in greenhouses. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, and what about um, challenges that you see <clears throat> with biocontrols for new farmers, and particularly for that subgroup? New farmers are probably amongst the, the first adopters. They're willing to try something new and watch. Um, so I think new farmers are always a great asset. They're, they're mm -hmm. inquisitive. Um, one of the problems might be that they might try something only once. They might not have the um, the um, economic stamina to try something for more than one year in a row. Mm -hmm. And sometimes to do something new, you do have to have that stamina. Mm -hmm. But as new farmers, they're going to face that in everything they do anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't. I, I new farmers are are very, very likely to adopt new technology. Mm -hmm. I think everything is new. <laughs> yeah. And I know you had some slides prepared um, about commercial uh, growers. And um, what is your best recommendations for commercial settings? Well, um, this might be the easiest way to make it easier. It's not working now. There we go. OK. So I hope I gave the idea that there's an awful lot of natural enemies in the field already that just need to not be interfered with. Mm -hmm. So that is the farmer's greatest asset. And then we also offer uh, biocontrols that we produce and they can be introduced into the field or into the greenhouse. Um, 
So, and this is my business here, the introduced um, BCAs. But we'll support the field ones as much as we possibly can. So we've had, we do successful biocontrol every single year in all the scraps. Mm -hmm. It's mind-boggling how much we do. Mm -hmm. um, cut flowers all over. Um, we were doing biocontrol thrips in Frisia, cut Frisia, 20 years ago mm -hmm. in Buffalo, New York, in cut flowers. And we're doing uh, all the vegetables, tomatoes, greenhouse vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, lettuce, um, raspberries in high tunnels, strawberries in fields mm -hmm. for sweet, uh, sediment control. They're used also in sweet corn and sweet peppers out in the field. But I don't know if you notice here, most of these um, natural, or these crops are actually inside crops. They're greenhouse crops. Mm -hmm. So the largest adoption has been in, in the greenhouses. Mm -hmm. And the reason, there's no natural enemies in greenhouses. You have to put them in. You don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. They're not naturally occurring. So, um, of course, you're successful because if you put something in where it's needed, it's going to be successful. So, and we do have a few things for the field, but not many. Here we are doing the sweet corn and sweet peppers. Mm -hmm. you know, a natural enemy that um, actually does not establish, it does not overwinter in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. So that's why. So how would you consider a success? A success would be um, no economic damage on the crop. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And in many cases, in many of these settings these days, we do better than a pesticide ever could. Mm -hmm. There are um, flower growers in Canada that would tell you that they could not ship crops as clean as they do if they were using pesticides, mainly because the pesticides lose their effectiveness over years and and then um, the pests are resistant and the natural enemies just do better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So what's the most successful, you did ask me that, or, what, um, or what's the best technique? Every setting, every combination, I think there's an infinite number of combinations is unique and so you have to work with it. And that's what a scout or a consultant does, is they observe what the situation is and they respond. Um, and the natural enemies are also picky, so we have to choose the right ones for the right situation. Mm -hmm. Do you have an encyclopedic knowledge of this, or does it involve a lot of research for you to go back? Um, a lot of it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. So we can't really say it even doesn't qualify as research, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But research is so specific, and we're working in such general terms that even a bit of research doesn't always help that much. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're working it out based on the condition, each specific conditions of where, where you're looking at at each moment. Rather than a lot of times, mm -hmm. there there is wonderful research that has supported this, and mm -hmm. and yeah, there is encyclopedic knowledge. It's mm -hmm. um, there's just so much. I have like three filing cabinets of four drawers full of information. Mm -hmm. Hard to access though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, and, um, okay, and. Um, uh, okay, and um, you mentioned that you work across country. What regions are easier or more difficult uh, to work in? Well, obviously we're really interested in being sustainable and uh, it makes sense to be working in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Natural enemies have to be shipped overnight delivery. So if we're shipping to California, that's a $50 package automatically, whereas mm -hmm. if we're shipping to New York State, it is for the freight uh, ten dollars, mm -hmm. and somewhere in the Northeast it might be twenty five dollars. But that just and the other thing is that if you're shipping long distances, there's often delays. Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, it's better just to work in a smaller region. Mm -hmm. 
but we do serve the whole country when we need to. Mm -hmm. Great. And see what I had next. Oh, yeah. That is a depiction of the naturally occurring reservoir of beneficials and what the introduced biocontrols are in relation is a drop in the bucket, mm -hmm. a literal drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do find is that, like I said, in the greenhouses, the introduced uh, biocontrols are the majority, mm -hmm. and, and that is why we're so successful in greenhouses because it's a more controlled environment. Yes. Okay. Because there are no right. naturally occurring natural enemies mm -hmm. right. that just aren't there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like putting a drop of a drop of ink in a glass of water versus in a in a lake. So it's just kind yeah, of like a that's a good. That's a really good. Yeah, so I can see that metaphor. Uh -huh. So we do have a comparison with greenhouses that are called high tunnels, and okay, so that one's disappeared. Oh yeah, here's a little slide. This is some data. Uh, Canada ha happens to have created a huge greenhouse industry many years ago now, and extremely advanced mm -hmm. in greenhouse vegetables in uh, Ontario and British Columbia in 2001, 85% were using biocontrols, mm -hmm. and 100% were using biocontrols in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, in Maine and Vermont, 71% in 2013, which is a huge advance for us. Mm -hmm. We're way ahead <laughs> of where we used to be. Yeah, definitely. So, and a big shift from where you started your career. So, yeah, when I started my career uh, selling beneficials, it might have been one in a hundred mm -hmm. greenhouses was using beneficial insects and mites. Mm -hmm. So, well, wow, then okay, it's made a big difference. So we have another question here. Um, who's using biocontrol? Um, is it um, strictly organic uh, producers, conventional IPMs? How, who do you see as using biocontrol most effectively? Well, if how it, it depends upon how you what you think biocontrol is. Mm -hmm. Organic customers have never been very good customers of ours because. They already have a huge reservoir of natural enemies. Mm -hmm. They don't need more. However, they are uh, committed customers for certain paths. Um, really, uh, the majority of our customers are conventional growers, always have been. And, um, you know, one story we have is years ago, years, I mean, 20 years ago, a, a New York State grower needed cabbage root magnet control and wanted to know if nematodes would do it. And, and this was a conventional grow out in the field. And they were using a really toxic pesticide on their cabbage transplants in order to control the, uh, the cabbage magnet. And it wasn't doing very well. And it was really toxic. Toxic to humans, too. can't remember the name. It started with a D. But they switched to nematodes and they put on 25 million onto the transplants, the, uh, the little transplant plugs before they um, took them out to the field. And they dribbled another 25 million into the holes for their transplant water. And they have never used pesticides for cabbage maggot control since. Mm -hmm. So they were able to go from this, uh, I don't think it was dirt ban, but it was, it was one of those uh, really toxic, like organophosphates. Mm -hmm. And they've never gone back. Do you see that kind of significant shift? Um, you mentioned earlier with newer farmers how um, you know that often it's hard for them economically to um, make the change over several years just because it's not a strong buying business yet. And yet, when you say that kind of story, it makes it sound that, as if it's, it can be just a one-time, really powerful, instantaneous shift. So, do you see that I'm more common for this? I'm not saying that they were totally biocontrol after that. Mm -hmm. This was just cabbage maggot on their farm they were controlling. Mm -hmm. They were, I expect, using pesticides on many of their other crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was a 
powerful success mm -hmm. and they were able to continue. We do it this thing we do it this all one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They nobody can afford to risk their whole enterprise on an idea. Mm -hmm. They need to risk their their one little section on a trial mm -hmm. and then if it works well continue mm -hmm. developing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So all right. So I have some other, oh yeah, that was the slide I was looking for. We do have um, a lot of high tunnels. High tunnels are unheated greenhouses. Mm -hmm. The sides roll up. Mm -hmm. So essentially they're roofs to keep the rain off of plants in the um, in the warmer weather. And the sides go down to keep plants from freezing in the cooler weather. But when those sides are rolled up, there's a lot more natural enemies coming in from outside. And indeed, the high tunnel growers do not use as many beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are listening in, um, if your questions coming in on the chat, and I can just ask those of Carol as we go along. So thank you for your great questions and some good ones coming through. So keep them coming. Um, okay. So the fundamentals for successful biocontrol is you have to start before the pests get out of um, control. Mm -hmm. And this was um, always a problem in many research trials originally, was that um, scientists would have an outbreak and try to control them with natural enemies. Actually, you have to start when the pest population is low and you have to keep it down. Mm -hmm. Because a poison just kills everything indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. But a natural enemy, if, you're, if you need one uh, when the pest population is low, you're going to need a thousand or a million when the pest population is high, mm -hmm. nobody can produce that much. There mm -hmm. will never be enough natural enemies to knock down a pest outbreak, mm -hmm. except for perhaps nematodes. There's always an exception. Um, and obviously, you have to be able to identify the pests in order to choose the proper natural enemy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely how you, fundamental. How do you do that? It's just simple pest identification. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn, there's many aids on the web, uh, but it helps to have a mentor because there's, and it just helps to have practice. You have to just get out there and practice and compare different insects to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then compatibility of pesticides has gotten so much better over the years. It has made uh, biocontrol so much more feasible. There are so many pesticides that do not harm natural enemies like they used to. I had a list there, but I don't think I have it. So, okay. Okay, great. Question? So you have another good question. How do I monitor for natural enemies? Uh, sweet net is one, but what about other, um, what about cameras and other technologies? My favorite way to monitor for natural enemies is to go to plants that I expect them on. So it's by plant species. I call them guardian plants mm -hmm. because they are often a reservoir for natural enemies. They often will indicate how many pests are there as well. Um, sweet that that would be in the field. That that is laborious. You can certainly uh, check for mm -hmm. uh, in that all that all the sweep sweep net. What do you call that sweep net plug or whatever it is. But when I was doing sweep netting, we would sweep net the stuff and put it in alcohol so we'd kill it all. And then um, then we go and count everything. And all you want to know is if the natural enemies are there or not. Mm -hmm. um, you could do it with a sweep net. And then you could release them so you didn't have to kill them. The problem with taking stuff back to the lab and alcohol is a lot of times it doesn't get counted until nine months from now when we don't need to know the information anymore for our decision that we have to make today. So, yeah, as long as the sweep netter is counting immediately or identifying immediately, that's okay. So could you talk more about guardian plants? I noticed there was something on the website about guardian plants. Oh, that would probably be a whole other session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> but uh, as I said, there are plants that I think will serve as indicators of the health of the system. Mm -hmm. So I, and it's, for example, I think marigolds can 
tell you that because they pull thrips, they're pulling in thrips all the time, and if there's a, if there's natural enemies there, uh, they'll indicate what the ratio might be of thrips to natural enemies. And, um, so they're useful that way. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, um, do we have any more questions uh, coming in? Oh, we have two right here. Um, so, uh, the question: My garden has a shrub that the aphids consumed last year. What biological uh, control tools could I have used, and what would an IPM approach look like? Aphids consume the shrub. Wow, it's too bad something didn't get in there and take care of it. Normally, um, something would show up. Um, so one technique you might try, and you could try it immediately, is mm -hmm. just go out, buy sweet alyssum, um, put it near the shrub. That sweet alyssum will draw in a predator fly called a hoverfly. The hoverfly lays little or little eggs in the aphid colonies and creates this maggot. Mm -hmm. It's a clear maggot that looks kind of warty, and it mows down aphids. It's really, really important aphid predator. And I'm surprised they didn't take the aphids out on your shrub automatically in the first place. Um, I wonder if it's a really urban setting with no plants in the area. Um, it's not. Otherwise, you might, something to purchase, you could buy some ladybugs. You could buy some ladybugs. They would uh, knock them down pretty quickly as well. Great. Thank you very much. All right, and um, oh, so this is a great question. So what are the important skills and knowledge um, to, uh, to do your work effectively? For us in the uh, biocontrol world, we're often dealing with tiny things. Mm -hmm. um, predatory mites, we, we use, after nematodes, our most used beneficials are predatory mites. And they're just at the edge of vision. Mm -hmm. So it helps to be able to see small things. <laughs> And um, it also helps to be able to count very quickly or just get an idea, like is it 50, is it 25, is there two? So numbers uh, relationship. I'm even counting people in the room, like if, <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll notice that consultants and um, scouts can quickly assess how many people are in a room. <laughs> But uh, you need to have basic understanding of the, of the pests and, and the life cycles of both the pests and the BCA. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to start identifying stuff. You have to be able to tell the difference between aphids. Mm -hmm. Aphid species is important. We're identifying aphid species all the time. Mm -hmm. okay, great. All right, we have another question. Um, what causes pest outbreaks? That is a great question. There are so, question is, uh, yeah, what causes pest outbreaks? There are so many things. Um, what causes something to go out of balance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Natural enemies disappeared. Um, they might have disappeared because of the climate's wrong. It might be too hot and dry. And that could be a problem from climate change. Mm -hmm. But we run into that quite often, like it could be a, a hot, dry summer. And then all of a sudden, the spider mites break out. That's because the predatory mites aren't reproducing as normal as they normally would. Mm -hmm. um, it could be pesticides. Mm -hmm. It could be dust. People actually have outbreaks from uh, orchards have outbreaks next to the dirt roads where the dust comes up and kills the little wasps and the little predatory mites that are going after scales and uh, spider mites. It could be diesel fumes. Diesel fumes um, uh, coming into a greenhouse can knock out natural enemies. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, there's a number of things, but the balance is off from okay. the outbreak. Okay, that's the rest of that question. Well, there's another question, which is uh, what is your definition of real time with regard to dealing with, um, with pests using biocontrols? Real time, oh, yeah. For dealing with biocontrols, we almost have to be ahead of the game. We have to be ahead of the game. We have to have the natural enemies there when the pest shows up mm -hmm. or the week after. So that's real time. We can't make the decision a month later. You have to make it 
You have to make it, real time is you have to make your decisions in the same week. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes if it's bad enough, you have to make your decisions in the same hour, but usually it's in the same week. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, okay. And would you like to talk about what I'm here? I wanted to give an example of some biocontrols. Mm -hmm. um, and this one was just to show how different crops, this is rose and strawberry, can have a, a completely different biocontrol result based on the system. Spider mites on roses like can lay 130 eggs to a female, but on strawberries only 38 eggs at the same temperature, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So that would mean you're much more prone to problems in roses than in strawberries, and that you would have to have more natural enemies in the roses. Mm -hmm. So when somebody wants to have a recommendation for how many, this is what people are asking. What do I need, how many, and how often do I need it? Mm -hmm. Those are the three questions, pretty much. Um, it's going to be different by crop. And I, I just wanted to show why that might be the case. So my instantaneous question back is, what are you growing? I'm always asking, what are you growing? Because I don't know if it's cucumbers, roses, mm -hmm. strawberries, bedding plants. I just don't know until they tell me. I have to know. Mm -hmm. It's hugely important. So if mites reproduce 40 to 100 fold in a single generation, obviously biocontrols need to be put on at the first generation. Mm -hmm. That's right away. Mm -hmm. Not You don't wait to see what they're going to do, you, mm -hmm. especially in a greenhouse setting. You might wait to see what they're going to do outside, but in a greenhouse setting, you don't have natural enemies, so you have to put them in. Okay. Yeah, so we can skip that. Okay. You just press the permit here you go. Okay. Oh, and here's some spider mite biocontrol. Here's um, here's the predatory mite that's mm -hmm. really common. Here's the eggs of that mite. It's almost as big as the abdomen of the poor mite. Mm -hmm. And they put out two more of those, two or more of those eggs a day. I don't know how they do it. There's a predator egg and a spider mite egg. Um, and here is a little beetle that's really common. This is Stethorus punctum. We're selling something called Stethorus punctum. Mm -hmm. um, really common in the environment. This is very, very uh, numerous in apple orchards, the Stethorus punctum. This is um, common throughout the Northeast in the landscape, but we also sell it. Um, it just goes for hot spots. It's a lady beetle. It's very, very uh, mobile, mm -hmm. and it'll find the hot spots. Uh, and go to it and consume the eggs of the spider mites and the spider mites, both, all stages. We sell all these predatory mites for spider mite control, persimilis, californicus, phalaisis, longibus, and this little midge uh, called Beltiella, and I don't have a picture of that. We have many, many things. These are more mites you'll see, cucumerus, sorisky, um, stradios are mites. Those are for osmosis uh, control. Um, and here's our little aureus that you met earlier. And then we have uh, this little rove beetle. Rove beetles are very, very underappreciated. Mm -hmm. It's our first rove beetle available commercially. Um, they're soil inhabitants. They are so underappreciated that the taxonomy hasn't worked out. But they're in the ground doing working all the time uh, on controlling pests. This fellow is the champion of nematodes. He brought the um, use of nematodes to the U.S. from Europe, mm -hmm. and um, they're being used really significantly throughout the United States now every single week for thrips control and greenhouses. Great photograph. Yeah. They're one of his workers is just spraying. You see these are nematodes coming out with that water, and there's no protective equipment. No mm -hmm. pesticides. It is not a pet. This is probably not a pesticide applicating guy, and uh, it's safe. Beautiful. All right, we're getting close to the end of our time, and we have one other last question. Um, is there anyone that you know of who's working on genetic work for biocontrols or enhancing their beneficial characteristics, uh, like we see going on in crops? 
I don't know of a commercial effort of working on genetics. Um, one of our concerns with refined gene pools in natural enemy populations is that they become um, weaker, kind of like the bee decline that's been happening. Now people are starting to blame it on the queens being too inbred. Mm -hmm. So some people are a little skeptical of it from that point of view. Um, but in the let's 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 just step back a minute and say, okay, selected natural enemies. Those those that are selected for genetic properties, not necessarily genetically engineered. Certainly we have a number of, of predatory mites that are resistant to a lot of pesticides, um, partly because they're being selected that way. Mm -hmm. And that's being selected in a practical way, not in a, a genetically engineered way. But it, it certainly, it's, it's, we certainly know it exists. We have some, there are lots of pesticide resistant strains of predatory mites. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. And is there anything else that you would um, like to leave uh, people who are watching this and watching the recording about biocontrol? Well, I just would like to emphasize that um, yeah, biocontrols are taking their originally intended spot in IPM programs today. They're taking them in a huge percentage in in the greenhouse setting, and they're moving into the field setting. Um, and they're more available and successful than ever before. For example, uh, my company sells 42 species of beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes, and the pesticides are making it more and more feasible for the natural enemies in the field to survive as well, mm -hmm. the, the more, um, the less, the more selective pesticides. So yeah, I'd just like to make sure that biocontrols are given their due in IPM. Great. And do you want to leave us with this uh, note for success? Well, for success, you need to have the right BCA for the pest and the habitat, and so your um, supplier can help you by making that selection. You have to start when the pest is just starting, so you have to release early. They often do have to be repeated for, for a number of reasons, and always select pesticides that are least harmful to the biocontrol agents. Lovely. Well, thank you very, very much for your time and sharing your expertise. And oh, thanks for yeah. having me, Jen. I okay. appreciate it. You're welcome. And if people have questions, there's contact information for uh, Carol's company on our website. And I uh, just really appreciate your time. Okay, also here. Okay, <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Even better, it's right there. <laughs> All right, lovely. And thank you for the people that joined us and for sharing your questions with us. And uh, we have another webinar coming up uh, next Wednesday at 10.30. And uh, we look forward to uh, sharing this space with you again then. And thanks very much. <laughs>